Hello. Hi, everybody. It's great to see you all. We're starting our very exciting new project. Uh, it's called Dev Propulsion Labs. It's our attempt to bring more uh, attention to the space of developer tools. And today we're kicking off with the first episode on community building with my amazing speakers. And my name is Victoria. I'm an evil Martian. I'm going to give a quick round of intros to all our speakers today, and we'll dive right into the nitty gritty questions about develop, uh, community building. So uh, let's start with Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia here runs developer relations at StackBlitz. She's a front end developer, tech writer, educator. Uh, she's passionate about making tech accessible and diverse. Uh, she's also a co-organizer at React Robins and commun a community for women and non-binary React devs. Sylvia, uh, a quick word to you, please introduce mm -hmm. yourself. Well, your introduction was great. Hey, everyone. I'm really excited to be here with you and learn, fr learn from you. Um, I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Next up is Ben Arndt. Uh, ben uh, runs um, developer relations at, Go at Teleport. Um, he thrives on helping both enterprise and the open source community via the open core product offering. Ben, uh, a quick word to you. Great. I think that was a great intro. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to chat today about community. Um, it's always been an important part of Teleport itself. And then also throughout my career, I've worked in multiple communities. So really excited for today's conversation. Uh, next up, we have D Don Goodman Wilson. Uh, he is trained in humanities and computer science. He has a passion for bridging cultures and bringing broader context to contemporary issues. Uh, he runs a, an agency dedicated specifically to developer relations. Uh, Don, a quick word to you. Hi, I'm, I'm Don. Thanks for the, the very kind introduction. Uh, yeah, I always get very excited around anything involving uh, the professionalization of, of what it is that we do. So I'm, I'm excited to be talking about community with all of y'all today. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Andre Sidnik. He is the principal front end engineer at Evil Martians. He is the author of uh, Auto Prefixer Browser List, PostSS, and many other uh, amazing open source uh, projects. Andre, uh, quick word to you. Thank you for kind words. Uh, so yeah, I will try to share my experience of creating uh, of creating and working in the community of PostCSS, but also uh, Wikipedia. I was administrator there and a few meetups in the St. Petersburg. Okay, perfect. Um, so let's discuss community building. How about we uh, start from a very high level question? What's the value of a community for a developer tool and how does it help business? Uh, maybe we can start with Don on just this philosophical grand question. I think I think the value of, of community is is very straightforward in that it gives you uh, an, uh, an opportunity to uh, market and grow interest in your developer tool or your platform in a very organic way without relying on traditional marketing techniques, um, which frequently turn developers off. Right? They trust their peers uh, to make recommendations. Um, and when they're part of a community together, uh, they're much more likely to, to make and, and act on those, uh, those recommendations. Um, okay, maybe Sylvia can add a little bit to that and maybe specifically about StackBlitz and community, how it's uh, helping StackBlitz in its business. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, I think that first I will piggyback of what Dawn said. Um, there is um, a huge value in that uh, our, so in DevTools, um, our users are developers. That means that they are also oftentimes the decision makers on their teams. That means that uh, their recommendation or their satisfaction can carry a lot of uh, value. So the distance, if you think about it, like the different, the distance between their satisfaction and the scale of adoption is not as long as in other fields, right? So especially in DevTools, I think that um, adopting this community-driven uh, growth is like definitely just like the right decision. And there's another thing about DevTools. I think that it's very specific to DevTools is that, um, you know, we often say that our product is 
by engineers and for engineers. And that actually can lead to massive blind spots because there are only so few people in our company. And sadly, you know, uh, especially smaller companies tend to hire like-minded people, even if you are trying to hire a diverse crowd, you're, you know, ending up with people who are more or less similar. And because of that, you end up in a sort of a bubble. So if you have a community whose feedback you actually trust, then you can they can actually pro- provide you with so many insights that otherwise, I don't know, you would learn from Twitter uh-huh. <laughs> being tagged somewhere. And so on the one hand, it is, you know, developing something for people who will be using that. On the other hand, also helping your community um, be extremely happy with your product. Yeah, it sounds like the community needs to be that safe space where people feel free to genuinely share how they feel about a product, right? And not only about the good parts, but also the bad parts. And you have to balance how, you know, you take that into consideration. I think Um, sharing is one thing. I will just uh, add sharing is one thing. The other other part is also that they uh, need to feel that what they will tell you will be acted on. Uh-huh. So it's not only just creating space for people to just, you know, tell you everything they think about your product, good and bad, but actually also to see how how much uh, power they have to execute on these ideas. Mm. Yeah, I like that. Uh, ben, how about you? What do you think is the value of a developer community? So I think... Um... You know, just to kind of like step back a bit, all, you know, I think Silver can address this, like the engineers and sort of people like deciding and purchasing things, let's say 20 years ago, you're sort of prescribed what you had. And I think we're talking as sort of individual people who sort of run communities for our products, but there's also like the wider community. So if you're like a Ruby on Rails developer, that's like a big community. If you... And I think it's sort of, it's interesting how, let's say you have like a cloud provider, there's like a sort of an AWS community, but it's a lot more commercial. And I think the thing is you basically getting together with your peers and saying like, okay, how can I get together with my people in one sort of space, sort of share um, what's working well, what can be improved and sort of improve as a community in general. Mm-hmm. From a dev tool, you know, we run a open source, open core dev tool and our community it's sort of a blend of both uh you know when we first started we view our like communities are open source users we're like oh they're like the people who don't pay us that's our kind of community maybe someday they'll go to enterprise but the reality which already hit me we had like our first user conference is some of our both best advocates are also people who are in both communities they yeah. use our product in their home lab and they also use teleport at work and then it also like really humanizes. It's not like, is this person sort of like an enterprise customer or an open source community user? It's sort of a blend of both. And we sort of use like the orbit model for how people are engaged. And so we just see like, are people being trusted leaders and advocates? That's like our number one thing that we try to do. And we will support a trusted leader and advocate, whether they don't pay us. And then we know that they'll recommend it to their friends and it'll solve their problem. And I think ultimately we're just trying to, you know, amplify the voice that we have a problem that sort of solves a solution and hopefully if people come join our community we can help support them mm-hmm. awesome so i'll jump right next to the question with you ben what's the right time to start a community so what do you think uh is the best uh you know what's the best I, practice <laughs> i think we chatted about this before the call and i um i have friends at mux mux is a video encoding product which is sort of closed source. And they, before they actually launched Mux, they noticed that in their space for video encoding, it's a disparate community of people. So you have people who are like video engineers, you have video streamers, but there wasn't one central place in which you could go and sort of argue like, what's the problems with different video codecs? And so they created a space that everyone could get together and be like, oh, like H426, VAV1, like what's the pros and cons of compression? And they kind of created that community that people could get together and argue. And that sort of influenced some of what they built into sort of Mux to sort of solve those problems. And so they actually built their community before they built their product. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sylvia, what do you think? Because you're also, you know, 
I have a hot take. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Well, I would say that the right time to start building a community is as soon as you're actually ready to show up um, in a consistent way. And also um, as soon as you are ready to support the community manager. So this is maybe not so much in this is not so much in opposition to what Ben you said, but um I think that those two things we oftentimes don't think about. We think that, oh, you know, um, community, we just say hi and it just grows and it's a happy place. But the thing is that if you're doing the community right, it's going to actually grow. And so you'll be hearing a lot of satisfaction. You also have to manage that. But you will also hear a lot of dissatisfaction. And either can actually be really taxing. So, you know, on the one hand, that means that you need to, I mean, there is nothing there is nothing worse, in my opinion, than building a momentum, building a community, you know, building that trust and then just like disappearing because you have other priorities. <laughs> this is just like the worst thing you can do for your community and also for your product and for yourself. And so it's a great there, answer. Yeah. Yeah, there is also, you know, the question of the of the community manager that oftentimes we just think, oh, this person is so, you know, sparkly and happy. They can manage the community. But then, you know, there that is a lot to manage. <laughs> so there are two things I would say uh, to really consider. But as soon as possible, that would be, um, you know, the short answer. Just to expand on this real quick, uh, so you mentioned that this like uh, community leader is sparkly or whatever, like a bubbly nice person. What do you think makes a good community leader? Like what are those qualities that would keep them, well, happy and sane, you know, for a long time, but also useful in their kind of position? Yeah, so I would say that the qualities that make a good community leader are actually very, I mean, are actually not what commonly we associate with good community leader, right? So oftentimes we think about the bubbly and sparkly person, but from my experience, the best communities um, thrive under the leaders who are honest, transparent, and communicate with integrity, and who are also a part of a team that has their back, right? So it's not, oftentimes we are thinking about who should lead the community, and um, let's say, of course, there are many people with different skill sets, but um, I would really designate a person, a specific person to lead the community and then maybe tie in different uh, team members mm -hmm. so that there's one person who can, you know, be like the rock who provides the rules, but also, you know, like um, delivers good news. And then that person doesn't have to have the whole expertise on everything about the company. They can actually just tag another, you know, team. Uh -huh. So, uh -huh. yeah, like I would say a good community leader is also a very good uh, diplomat who also understands that it is a long term commitment and oftentimes needs to explain it to, let's say, the team or the CEO that um, community is not necessarily measurable. So a lot of diplomacy, honesty, transparency needed. Um, it sounds like a good community leader also needs to delegate, you know, because it's you can't really do everything by yourself. Speaking of doing everything by yourself, <laughs> Andre, uh, let's talk about how 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 do you begin building a community? Let's say if we take post CSS, right? Uh, how how did it come about? How do you go about building a community? Uh, who should be in charge and things like that. Um, there is a very interesting case here because we are all talking about the community like in, in our uh, internet, like a tool, like an object, which we try to solve our problem. But I see a community in a little bit different way. Uh, Wikipedia show me it. Like initially Wikipedia was a project created um, as a like a com uh, comment platform for the people who writing a real encyclopedia, mm -hmm. but uh, the people who join this project they get a power, they got a power, and you know overrule the creator of Wikipedia. The whole Wikipedia was made it not by the creator, mm -hmm. but by the community, mm -hmm. and this is why like I really mm, talking about who should be in charge. My like. Uh, nation, um, natural answer will be the community, of course, because the community is, over, is the subject. Uh, for instance, in post-CSS, 
uh, initially uh, I focused, I created post CSS as like a modular uh, SAS. So it's, it was a completely different view how it evolves right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, But this is, was a wrong way of thinking. A lot of people came and say that they don't want to make a project in this way. They want completely different system. Mm. And because the post CSS was completely um, chaotical project, like without any rulers, without any ways, you know, CSS next, etc. They start to create their own brands on top of my technology. Mm -hmm. And it leads me to a completely new way of thinking about the mm -hmm. uh, solution. So community could be also not a tool, but a trickster for yourself, for your company, which will open a completely new possibility for your company. So technically, of course, there should be a person, but which like uh, have everything in mind about your community, but it should be not, you know, a leader of community. It should be, mm -hmm. you know, as a, like a uh, embassy inside the community. Mm. I like that. In a way, you need to be kind of like a good parent, you know, when you're not projecting your ideas onto other people, right? And instead, you're just like allowing them to flourish in the best way possible. Um, and and you as an author, how does it make you feel <laughs> when you see that community grow? And maybe when it grows beyond your expectations, you know, how does it make you feel? If it's go, it's if it's grow beyond your expectation in modern open source, it's like uh, means that you have not do a lot of stuff because they will do it by <laughs> themselves. When somebody fork your project and create completely new projects, it means that you finally can go rest and don't have this obligation to the community. <laughs> so like it's more in this way. But uh, to be honest, um, this like uh, embassy type community, mm -hmm. it brings a lot of you know. Um, warm feelings because you see not like uh a workers of not like a co-workers of you but you see a friends who mm -hmm. like share the idea mm -hmm. idea is much bigger than you and this feeling is very nice to be honest okay. but uh honestly there is like this is like um idealistic way but in the reality there is like um in post CSS we have another problem in some moment, without the strict view of how post CSS should be used, because every like plugin developer have its uh, own view, we mm -hmm. ended with the things which like it's just you know an idea, and every person should create its own, uh, their own set of like post CSS plugins. Mm -hmm. And in the reality, it mostly stop the post CSS development because mm -hmm. um, only this small community we was like people who like exper experimented with the stuff most of the people they just want a one single solution yeah so maybe the answer the program uh, program the real answer is something in between mm -hmm. but we should not forget about you know the the ideal answer yeah i mean it's kind of philosophical right mm -hmm. uh Don, what do you think is the best practice in creating a community? Who should be leading the community? Uh, just let's expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question um, because here, here's my spicy take for the evening, uh, which is you, you can't create community. It's not a thing that you can do. Um, communities are organic. They're a gathering of people who've come together to solve a problem that they can't solve by themselves. They need help with. Um, and it's something that they can only tackle as a, a group of people working together. Um, creating community implies creating a problem for the community to solve, um, but they're only gonna come together to solve that problem if it's, if it's in their own interest. So, so really you can only facilitate community coming into being, right, by identifying a problem that's not yet solved, that's interesting to people, or identifying groups of people or individuals who are working towards a solution in isolation and bringing them together in the same room, mm -hmm. right? So facilitating the, a, a community requires already knowing some answers to these kinds of questions, right? And a lot of open source projects begin with, oh, I have this problem, I want to solve it, right? And I think, I feel that other people probably have a similar sort of problem or related problem or a different perspective on this problem. And in virtue of, of somebody, me perhaps, going out and creating an open source project, 
and trying to start conversations with these people, then, then more people will come as they, as they identify with that problem, as they identify with the attempts to solve that problem, right? And I, I think this is this is a difficulty for a lot of startups that, that mm-hmm. want a community is they're, they're missing that that key step. They think, well, if I, if I put a project on GitHub or if I uh, uh, open a Discord server, that, that's my community. But that's that's missing like that first crucial step of identifying this, the shared problem that people can get really passionate about. That's providing a platform for community interaction, but that's not the community itself, right? Yeah. So, so first up should not be things like starting with Discord or putting a project Mm-hmm. On, on GitHub, but it should be going out and talking with people that you know already that you feel um, uh, could serve the seed as a sort of community and leveraging your existing network. So, so who should be starting? It should be, it should be somebody who's very clued into the, the technical or engineering, engineering problems um, uh, that you think you can build a community around. And it should be somebody with sufficient network contacts uh, mm-hmm. uh, that they can reach out to them um, and start the nucleus of that that community. That's that's my take on it, of course. But yeah, that's that's how I approach this this question. Mm-hmm. Uh, ben, what do you think about that? How do you, you know, who should be leading the community? Um, I mean, I definitely agree with Don. Um, all of his points very relevant. I think actually one interesting thing with sort of our community of users, which is kind of unique is that we're in a open source security tool mm-hmm. and actually many people don't want to publicly talk about their security problems in like a public domain and um i actually did a couple of events last year following the chatton house rule the chatton house is like an old english uh club in which the idea is you can go to this um venue you can take the learnings from everyone else but you can't share who said it and actually, mm-hmm. I found by creating an environment in which people could sort of share openly and not say like, oh, this like large Fortune 500 fintech is doing this and engineers could very collaborate and not only just on like our product, also on like all the other problems that they're running into, because there's often these silos and when people sort of don't get together, um, mm-hmm. they'll sort of like uncover more value. Um, and then, you know, also about like leading, I think we can sort of do something sort of similar. Um, while we do have sort of forums in which people can interact, like every, it's a mixture of like engineers, our CTO, our CEO is kind of in there answering kind of questions. Um, and so we actually uh, distribute everyone kind of like leading it. We will uh-huh. help facilitate some conversations, but um, we find it sort of quicker just for, you know, engineers to directly answer. And that also like helps with the feedback loops of like improving our open source project. And, um, you know, like our, our backlog is all public as well. Um, mm-hmm. I think one interesting thing is like, we're not, while we're an open core company, like open source, we're pretty hostile to pull requests because of the nature of the product. Um, you know, right. Like the tech, like tests security issues it just is quite hostile so we often like work together if people do want to put a pull request in but that's actually one area in which we don't um overly facilitate more than like other open source projects okay thank you um uh, i want to come back to what don said just previously uh you were talking about people sharing the same problem right and then they come together and kind of try to resolve it how do you keep motivating people to come back and do things? You know, how do how do you make sure they bring value to each other, but also that they're able to solve their problems? You know, with with the tool or within this community. Um. Yeah. So that question brings me back to a point I wanted to raise uh, uh, with the, the first question, which which I think will actually address this question, which is. It's, it's one thing to ask, what is the value of community to a product, right? But given that a community is a collaborative problem-solving effort, the real the real question should be, like, what value can you bring to a potential community right? as, a, as, a, as a product, as a startup? Um, and that value, whatever it is, we could talk about some, some examples of what, what that looks like, but that, that value is what motivates them to continue participating. Right, um, because if the if the participants in the community are getting nothing out of it, if they do not see any value in themselves, if they're not sharing in the rewards of what the community is building, then they're going to become demotivated super quickly. Right, so you need to find something suitable for your community, and it's always going to be fairly bespoke. Um, that uh, 
that creates value for them and that, that will incentivize them to continue participating. So a couple of examples, um, uh, GitHub, uh, for the longest time uh, had, and they still have, right? Uh, but it was a, more of a big deal 10 years ago, um, a fantastic collection of stickers, right? So they had this <laughs> adorable mascot, Mona Lisa, Mona, Mona Lisa Octocat, right? And they would make all sorts of stickers of her in different costumes, uh, some of them infringing on trademarks and copyrights, but we won't go into that. But they were all they were all fun, right? And the only way to get one of these stickers uh, was to meet somebody who worked from GitHub, which was probably easier than you think it would be as a, as a globally distributed workforce. But th these stickers imbued um, uh, a bit of reputation, right, to the bearer of the stickers because it means yes, they had met somebody from GitHub and had a conversation with them, um, and in fact maybe. They, they found a, a particularly rare or unusual sticker. There are hundreds, if not thousands of designs. There, there used to be a site where you could see all the different designs and it would be like a checklist to see which ones that you, you had managed to collect, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in the early days of GitHub's community, the, the value, the currency that was used to drive that community was stickers, right? This is not a model that's gonna work super well today. A lot of people try to copy it. I think stickers are not not super valuable in and of themselves, right? But but the reputation buff in general, like, is a really good value that you can offer your your community. So many open source projects um, uh, provide this value to their community. The bigger, more popular the open source project is, the more it means to say on your CV, "I'm a contributor to this project mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. going to get you a better job. It's going to get you better pay." It's going to make you look better to your peers, and your boss, right? Um, and so that that's a huge um, sort of value that a community can provide. Um, other examples include financial incentives, right? This is straight up you you can you can pay your community. Now I don't recommend that you do that, right? But um, an example of this actually happening and being fairly successful um, was when Slack launched their app marketplace, and they wanted to create this third category of applications, right? Desktop apps, mobile apps, and chat apps, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we had a community of chat app developers who were working together to sort of figure out what, what even is a, a chat app? What are the best practices for developing them? What are the best practices for the, the UX? There's so many open questions around this. Um, but we, we actually started at Slack, we started a, a, a small venture capital fund right, uh, where we could provide seed funding or, or very early stage funding to very promising startups building app, uh, chat applications for the, the Slack um, uh, marketplace. And so yeah, I don't remember what the sums of numbers involved were, right, but we were able to fund three or four companies at their earliest stages uh, who had extremely promising ideas that also looked like they really help Slack's growth take off, right? So, but that, and that was a huge incentive, right? We'd all sit together in a room and try to think of the best ideas for, for apps and bounce them off of each other um, uh, in an attempt ultimately to build businesses that could tap into this source of funding and ostensibly the, the kinds of, of growth and opportunities that they came with building for that platform. It didn't really pan out in the end. We won't, we'll just gloss over that part of the story, right? But, but so, Applied in the right ways, so even money is, is something that you can use. But ideally, like maybe something more, more towards the, the reputation and the spectrum is easier for many uh, uh, startups to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, Andre, how about open source? How do you motivate people to bring value to each other within the open source realm? And uh, how do you make sure that they don't burn out? <laughs> this is to be honest uh, two different questions like first one how to bring people and then how to like uh, keep them working uh, on the task i really like the idea from don that like community is creating the share problem like this is uh, my the main hot take which i will take from this uh i hope maybe it will be another one even better but still. They so will, uh, i believe that maybe like uh, the best way to um uh, keep people inside the the feedback loop of the community is to uh, allow them to see their feedback uh, their impact on mm -hmm. for instance solving this problem for instance if we have uh, like sort of a public uh, list of the issues and people can vote 
uh, for these issues. If these people will see that uh, developers solve issues according to uh, they talk with C CTO, but not according to the votes, mm -hmm. they will feel that all their action has no result. Mm -hmm. And for instance, in post CSS, when somebody create a plugin, uh, it was like mm, I uh, immediately create a tweet in the public uh, post CSS account. I start to like uh, write a suggestion how to improve them this plugin and. It was so happy that somebody saw them, that somebody like mm -hmm. tried to push the product to the market, helping them like, you know, and it's really motivate people. But of okay. course, this is only from the st uh, stage when they already make the first step, because how to make the first step is a uh, very big and complicated question. Uh, your activists overcome that barrier to participation because many people feel intimidated, you know, because when you are doing something in public, in the community, you are very much visible, you are vulnerable, right? How do you help them? Sylvia, maybe you can uh, help us unpack this question. How do you help? How do you reward your champions? How do you help people overcome this initial barrier to even participate in the first place? Yeah, definitely. I think that it is really important to recognize that um, even though we are talking about a community, and the community is really different communities. <laughs> and so you will have people who are very experienced and then maybe more of newbies and even like very experienced devs who actually never had, you know, opportunity to work with this specific stack or, you know, in this specific, I don't know, problem area. And so you want to have people in your community, not necessarily even on your core team, but like just, um, ambassadors or however you want to call them who know how to communicate to different audiences meaning um com explain different things um in a way that doesn't offend the ego of those super mm -hmm. um advanced and also doesn't intimidate those who maybe are very new uh, or just new let's say to open source if we are talking about open source and so then so first you know you really need some kind of like guidelines for those community maintainers on how to shape the community vibe i will come back to i will circle back to what don said about uh, identifying a problem i really like that however i also i have also i have opinions <laughs> so um i agree that um to build a community, we need to uh, we need to either create a problem or actually identify a problem and um, bring to bring people together. However, when thinking about community, we should be uh, thinking about you know running people around the solution. And I know that that's what Don said, but I just want to uh, emphasize that because you can actually see right now in um, you know web dev um, kind of space, there are some communities that were rallied around the problem and continue to be in the problem. Mm -hmm. And that has a very different vibe. And so mm -hmm. if you are, if you're running people around the emotion of being angry or frustrated, that is going to be the emotion of your community. Yeah. If you're running people around uh, problem solving and coming together to you know, build something better, that already kind of shifts the mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, so first, you know, you need some kind of communication, uh, like grand rules. Then um, just it's about problem solving again. What Don said. Um, so like you need to figure out what people need and what they lack, right? So for mm -hmm. example, they need visibility. Okay, be generous with shout outs. Give them possibility to be, you know, to, to share the spotlight. Do they need to grow uh, an opportunity to grow? Assign tasks and maybe assign a body or kind of like accountability body even, you know, so that they can actually have the environment in which they can contribute in a positive way. And mm -hmm. then also think about like maybe uh, rewarding different types of contributions because oftentimes in tech, it's like, oh, engineers are so great. Then there are docs. That is such a problem because oftentimes people who start with the documentation then mm -hmm. can actually move on to something, you know, engineering. And maybe actually we don't need that at all. Maybe great documentation is the problem of a given framework. And so I want to, uh, in this space, I want to give um, on this, in this point, I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Sarah Rainsberger from Astro Team, who is excellent 
excellent with building community around Astrodox and just um, holding the space and giving the space, giving the spotlight to her community. Literally, mm -hmm. I just go to Astro uh, Discord just to chill, just to hang out. <laughs> are so nice. <laughs> And like they have a whole system of rewards and of helping people just really excel. And then there is another community that is also really excellent. That's Vit community, mm -hmm. uh, where people just like just feel a part of it immediately. It's the whole setup of their Discord, of their you know public channels. And here you know the shout out goes to Matthias Capaletto, or also known as Patak. So I just really want you, like everyone who is watching that, to. If you're looking for inspiration, I mean, you can look at us, but then you can also just go to those two discords or like just talk to those two people and you will learn so much. Yeah, it's so interesting because it, I feel like people want to feel good about themselves, right? And they just want to feel good. So it makes sense uh, to create a community where people want to come back. You know, you, obviously you don't want it to be a toxic community. You want it to be a very kind of nice place to be. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's just like a general rule of uh, thumb there. Ben, do you have any best practices and kind of rewarding champions and just uh, motivating people to, you know, to stay active? Yeah, I think um, in our space, especially, you know, we're sort of in the same realm as like cloud native kind of infrastructure. Um, and I think one thing that people often you know, we think about open source communities, people to the point of, it's not just like commits, often it's just like running the software. Mm -hmm. And actually like, let's say take the Kubernetes community, a lot of the Kubernetes community is more just about like taking this software running and building your applications with all of these open source components and showing like, oh, what's the value you can get from that? Um, for us, we do the same thing, like for our community users, we actually have like an interesting self well one to step back a bit like we're very privacy centric and so we actually don't have very much information about like when people install teleport we don't know it and it's self-reported so like how can people self-report in a developer specific way and so when you uh install teleport on the terminal it outputs like a curl command and then you like curl us a message and we like send people like a swag package and so this is like one of the post install rewards they can give us like their use case mm -hmm. <clears throat> And um, this has been like a lightweight way in which people have sort of opted into giving us a little bit of information. We send them some swag, we sort of follow up for our survey. Um, and I think the in incentives point is an interesting aspect of uh, Dom. Like we do lots of sort of live streams and things. And I think there's definitely like a couple of people who will join a community just for like the t-shirt or the swag. Um, we see that a lot. Um, and we always try to, you know, start off with the lowest value item that we have but you still have to kind of like earn it and so like show us you've deployed a cluster or show us that you have this thing before you can sort of earn those rewards do people like collect them like do you have like a teleport collection <laughs> um we do have a collection and some of them also limited edition we got a plushie made um, oh I nice yeah i think that's the next version of um stickers yeah, yeah the plushie is great but um, yes, the logistics of sending swag around the world is also like super complicated as well. Yeah. And so I kind of like, uh, Andrea's just, you know, like if people are advocates, like send a tweet, do something that doesn't necessarily require always shipping stuff around the world. And also, you know, like, trying to reduce waste as well. I think uh, it can be a pretty wasteful yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. endeavor. Yeah, for sure. Actually, just a quick side note, uh, we have this tradition at Evil Martians, we do pins every year. So for New Year's, we get like a little New Year's package and it's like a, a cr really nice card and a really cute pin. So yes, we have we are growing the collection. One is like a Statue of Liberty and the other one is um, something else. So and every year it's growing. So the more years you spend on Mars, the more you get them so i'm growing nice. my blazer collection you know so i can show them off <laughs> <laughs> um okay don do you have any um advice any practical advice on motivating the rewarding champions um so yes i think broadly speaking um it, there, there's this adage uh, among startups right or among 
companies broadly, uh, that the culture of a, of a company is set by the actions of its leadership, right? Not, not their words. Um, and it's the same thing within, within a community, right? Uh, so if you are, are very uh, thoughtful and very deliberate in the ways that you interact with the community, um, that can already be a lot to incentivize participation in, in the widest sense. So I, I used to run uh, uh, an online community ages and ages ago um, for, for model trains. Um, and we had some very toxic members in this community. And, and me and the other moderators immediately jumped in, handled the, the, these toxic moments, right? And took the necessary steps. Um, but mostly we, we were very public about this, mm -hmm. right? So that other members could see this sort of behavior is not cool. We're not going to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And what we saw in the wake of that was rapid growth in participation, mm -hmm. right? Because then people saw that they felt safe uh, participating and sharing within this community. Um, and that's a that's a huge incentive, right? They're just showing that you showing that you care uh, and that you care enough to set an appropriate and inclusive tone for for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you, do you feel like it's possible to do in a mature community, eliminate toxicity like when a community is already a little no <laughs> second hot take no I think I think this is something you have to start really really early um, and the more mature the community is the more the culture is is set right yeah. uh, and the more resistant that they're going to be to change even small changes. Um, uh, to, to that are not going to be super well received. I think I think you can do it, really, truly. I mean, a nose is a strong word. Yes, you can do it, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time. It's going to take perseverance. It's going to take a lot of intervention and a lot of stomach for losing chunks of your community in the process, right? Yeah. Um, but losing those chunks of, of your community, I mean, it's probably the most toxic elements that you're losing in the process. Maybe it's not the end of the world, but it feels bad to see the number go down instead of up, right? Yeah. Um, even if it will eventually start to go up later, I, so I think it's I think it's very very difficult, and much easier to just do this from the do do this right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like there is that tough transition period when you're losing like old toxic, you know, uh, elements and gaining new ones, and it's still kind of like this weird space when you don't have the critical mass. You know, the culture is kind of transitioning into something new. Uh, let's come back to our question that I put aside. Um, so let's start with Sylvia. Let's talk about uh, helping people not burn out and just the question of burning out as an activist in a community. Let's unpack this topic. Go. <laughs> there you go. go. Well, is this going to be a therapy session now? <laughs> no, a little bit, just a little. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I think that it's really important to talk about burnout with your community, uh, leader, manager, activist, very soon. And just to, you know, oftentimes people don't even, especially in those public facing ro roles and especially in those like service roles, they, are, they don't even know what uh, burnout is. Like, they know intellectually, but they don't, they are not taught to recognize that in themselves. And so I think it's really important to say that uh, spotting your burn, your early signs of burnout is one, is a part of your job. And then you have to just, you know, take a step back. So I think that it's, um, so of course, like it's a work with, with the person, like their self-awareness and, but there's, it's, I'm not saying that, um they have to do all the job right because they exist in an environment and in a system and so it's really important to uh never expect them to communicate after work hours let's say if this is a paid opportunity uh, because this job already comes with so many like expectations from the outside that and you are oftentimes made feel like that you are uh failing if you are not responding immediately right so creating an opportunity for the community um, leaders uh, to just not participate. Another thing is uh, having their back and, you know, just being ready to step in because there are different situations. Now, I'm not only talking about like their personal life, but like in general, in community, a lot can happen. <laughs> and we can't expect every single person to be able to be equipped to handle every single situation at every single time, right? So sometimes it is 
uh, really important to create this mutual uh, like um, rapport. Is that how you say support between um, the community leader and you know, like let's say the core team to so that they are they don't see those moments when they are unable to step in um, as their failures that they are rewarded you know for uh, setting boundaries for example. And then, you know, maybe I'm stating the obvious, but sadly, this is not something I see in the communities is, um, you know, not expecting community leaders to communicate with people who make them uncomfortable, who are maybe toxic, abusive, who are lacking self-awareness or who are just really frustrating and draining. Like we are all just people. And so different things, you know, you know, trigger different things in us, right? And so even if it's something trivial, there is a reason why, you know, the specific person finds it really challenging to, you know, tackle and so a, a certain situation. So yeah, like just being ready to providing the support system for the community leaders to be able to do their job. That's that's it. <laughs> I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Um it's interesting. I mean, safety is kind of like our number one priority, right? So, I mean, safety has to be uh, an important thing in the community. And sometimes um, it's something that takes time to uncover, you know, and obviously uh, equipped, experienced community leaders kind of are able to identify maybe those signs a little bit earlier. Um how about, uh, Andre? for example, your case, like how do you, first of all, how do you deal with toxicity in a community, right? And how do you prevent people from burning out or maybe yourself <laughs> from burning out, you know, uh, in maintaining like a big, well, many big projects uh, in the open source? If Postia says there is no such, uh, there is no big problem with um how people communicate because unfortunately or luckily uh, most of our uh, community members don't uh, write a message to each other they just write the plugins and so this is how we solve the problem but it was this whole huge problem in wikipedia and we still doesn't know the real answer because like um because wikipedia become a real big political engagement problem there was some people who, who try to start to manipulate the rules and it will become very dangerous. Uh, but like, it's a completely different topic. Uh, but talking about the burnout out in open source, like, especially in open source, we are missing two different terms. Like in our work, we have a burnout, a burnout out because we work too much. But in open source, it's a completely different system and it should be named in different way. In reality, as, at least what I feel uh, and what like uh, many other maintainers, which is uh, POC, feel is not uh, like working too much, but have lack of the feedback. So initially in most of the open source project, the maintainers was some sort of the village doctor, which do the work, but the whole village uh, gives them a lot of back, not only in the way of money, but sometimes in the way of respect, sometimes in like uh, personal communication, sometimes in uh, um, public space, uh, like opportunity to uh, change people's minds. Mm -hmm. But a lot of open source projects start in this way and people feel they feel back and they was completely okay to continue work in this way, to like work many hours, but have something in return. But right now, the main problem is that like uh, our ecosystem, like the whole uh, Silicon Valley, it use uh, open source as a like a free labor market rather than uh, like a people. And the main problem is that nobody really want to pay back. Like the real uh, flow of the nation in any way, not only in the money, but like especially in the money because we can like count it. It's so small that even the biggest projects, the most visible one, which takes a lot of money, have no enough money compared to the, the general developer in this team. Mm -hmm. And it goes not only from the uh, money, but it goes also to the like any warm communication. If you're a mm -hmm. maintainer, you will have only about uh, one or two nice, uh, warm, kind communication with you over the months. Mm -hmm. versus like uh, four or five like very uh, rage people who like have some problems with your uh, uh -huh. project. 
and uh, same with public visibility. Like mm -hmm. we mostly on our conference, sorry for mentioning it, but we have mostly a DevRels, not a maintainers. And so like they also cut the way to make a like to have public space. Mm -hmm. And uh, the third problem, which like even increases the, this, uh, these problems, is that the all uh, resources are going to the only top of the mm -hmm. ecosystem, top of the pipeline, because like uh, we have, on, for instance, in Google, they have a very nice system when like developers could uh, mm, put some open source project to the list. Mm -hmm. And if this project will be good, they will, like, uh, will be donated. But mm -hmm. the main problem, developers should know about this project. And they will know only about the projects, for instance, in the package JSON. And mm -hmm. as a result, nobody knows about the projects like in one step uh, ahead in dependency tree. Mm -hmm. And this is the last problem is completely on the GitHub and NPM side because which, they don't provide us a tool. Like mm -hmm. for instance, like a lot of developers asking for the subscription model Mm -hmm. When you like uh, donate some amount of money and they uh, spread according to the usage or something, there's no, the mass is not important. The most important mm -hmm. that it should be donated to every part of the dependency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that these three solutions will like improve the problem with uh, maintaining the burnout because right now, to be honest, about eighty percent of the open source maintainers doesn't want to do their job and they do it only because they. Mm, they were forced to do because mm -hmm. of the society and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It also feels like when the community is kind of orchestrated well, it's a little bit easier to reward maintainers, not maybe in monetary ways, you know, but, you know, as kind of words. <laughs> like the more uh, kind of like if you provide the safe space and the stage for people to talk about their achievements and their kind of contributions, I think it's a little bit easier to reward them, right? As as you said, Posse says um, maintainers speak plugins, you know, maybe it would be nice for them to have a space where they can speak words, you know, and that, that way be rewarded. Um, let's talk about uh, a, a nicer topic. Uh, let's talk about major releases. How do you prepare to major releases as... Um, you know, a person who is leading DevRel uh, for a big company. Ben, let's start with you. What do you do? <laughs> That's great. Well, I have a major release going tomorrow at 9 a.m. So this is <laughs> top of mind. <laughs> Tell us what you're going to do. What's your checklist? So one interesting thing, especially being like an open core company, is what the second you release it on GitHub, like everyone knows, the cat's kind of out the bag. And um you know, our um, not only is our releases public, our like test plan is public, so people can follow along like our alphas. But we actually, when we do our GitHub release, we do what we call like a marketing release about a month afterwards, mm -hmm. and that's not often enough to make like a, at least a point release. As with all software, you know, any major release is an opportunity to introduce breaking changes. It's kind of like a feature and a bug of um, releasing software. And so people who are very active in our communities will take us and give us kind of feedback during that period of time. But also I make, uh, like we have blog posts, we have videos, we have documentation to update, all of the other machinery to fully support the release. And we found about like a month afterwards, it's just enough time. And then, you know, by the time our like sales team or people kind of reach out, um, the software is pretty stable. Mm -hmm. I'd say one sort of interesting thing about our software is, we find that it does take a while for people to upgrade anyway. And so having the immediate release version, like there's always some part of the community who wants like nightly builds, but I think actually a lot of businesses want like stable software mm -hmm. and any new software that you release always introduces like new bugs as well. And mm -hmm. so um, that's kind of how we support our product releases. So a mixture of, I guess, like traditional product marketing, um, other activities we have like, social updates, but um, we have like our community Slack and just generally communicate and get more feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And Sylvia, how about you? You just had a really successful release not so long ago. And today you guys are launched on Product Hunt, right? I oh, yes, that's true. Please upvote. Yeah. <laughs> I will drop the link in the chat now. Yes. <laughs> um, Please do. <laughs> 
Well, yes, um, we just had a major release. Um, so actually, maybe I should also say what StackBits does. Yes, please <laughs> so, do. StackBits um, allows uh, basically running um, Node.js inside the browser. So we have this technology co uh, called uh, web containers, which uh, we used so far for like um, a very simple um, IDE for reproductions or like demos. And then we build a bigger one, which is uh, kind of a copy of uh, VS Code, but can run Node.js inside the browser. And then um, now recently, literally just like two weeks ago, we have released Web Container API. So now you all can actually just take it and build your own things. Please do and tell me about it <laughs> so I can <laughs> celebrate you all. But um but actually, so this this um, this API is such a lovely story for me um, because it started as so the whole product development was just as I would dream it. May, um, namely, we started it with a community member. So actually, it's felt kid Rich Harris reached out to us. They they wanted to build a tutorial for Svelte mm -hmm. Kid that would be able to that would be running inside the browser. And so we developed the API in very close collaboration with them. And then once that was announced in June, I believe, uh, at the conference, um, we you know we didn't yet go full public. We then started onboarding projects, different projects, and working very closely with them mm -hmm. because, you know, to gather more feedback to see what they are, you know, confused about, uh, what features they would need to build, you know, different use cases. And then, you know, and very slowly, we were also just like adding, improving the API. I was uh, literally, initially, we were just working, uh, there were just two people working on that, so myself, um, kind of liaisoning this kind of, this relationship with the community and an engineer uh, my my colleague uh, Roberto Vidal who was you know acting on that feedback so it was a really comfortable amazing collaboration also you know gave us a pl plenty of opportunity to be really close to different projects different community members and build this for them and so then we took all the questions that they had, all the points where they were, you know, stuck, and that informed our the development of our examples, of our docs, of, you know, all the content on our uh, platform. And so uh, you can check it out. It's webcontainers.io. And then we only released publicly. And um, because also before releasing, we... Uh, circled back to all those uh, community members that we asked for feedback or you know test mm -hmm. runs and uh, got more feedback to act on we actually um, postponed our release a few days to actually be even better prepared and to really validate the feedback we got and then because of the fact that the community was so involved but also because this is a tool that many people were really impatient about um it's the the release was just like massive. We weren't prepared for such success. Um, the the very tweet was you know read by uh, five like half a million people, wow. and then even now, um, even though it's already two weeks after the release, um, on a weekly basis, I actually just checked uh, for something else. But on a weekly basis, people read. People spent. Um, 18,000 minutes reading our docs, which means like <sighs> 12 days. <laughs> so that is, you know, that means there are, I mean, there are quite a few people visiting, but they are actually staying longer because, you know, the docs were designed very closely with the community. And so maybe that, maybe I didn't emphasize that enough, but because the community was very involved in the development, they also were very generous in sharing, you know, the support on Twitter, on, you know, Slack and so on and so forth. We already have quite a few really excellent projects built on that. And mm -hmm. we are about to release a community page with a gallery, with a gallery of different uh, inspirations from the community. And mm -hmm. some examples are just like, I, I would never think about that, you know, like low code solutions, AI, or like even CLI chess game, for example. So I'm so excited to see, you know, what will um, come to us next and how else we can support the community. We already have quite a few ideas. So this was such a happy story for us because, you know, like 
from the very beginning to the very end, we were very close to the community and we didn't rush the process. Mm -hmm. We just really took time to make sure that everyone everyone's feedback is acknowledged and that we are prepared for, you know, just really like serving the community with this tool. So yeah. I'm really happy about this. I don't know. If yeah, you yeah. it makes me happy <laughs> to listen to you be so happy about the release. I think it's such um, like it's such a holistic, mo you know, like process and it's like it just feels good i know that it feels good like just by looking at you and i congratulate you on the successful release and ben i hope your release goes super well as well where you know if i take a content of it i'll be happy <laughs> wishing you all the success there uh Andrea, one do you interesting want to... thing actually yeah, so yeah. It, um this is a pretty common strategy you know like you have the corporate organization stack blicks but you have web containers.io Maybe it's a good time to talk about like how, as a company, you sort of create something else that's kind of separate outside of your company to sort of support community. I wonder if you could touch Wait, on the benefits of that. Sorry, could you repeat? So you have, um, I guess you launched under webcontainers.io, which is sort of a separate kind of project. Could you talk about like some of the benefits of sort of creating a different sort of microsite for um, oh, yeah. that release? Oh yeah, definitely. So, you know, <laughs> Web containers as a product is, or actually as a tool. Um, I like to talk about it as a tool because it's free. Our the, our free tier is so generous, and also it is free entirely for open source, and so that's why I'm making the distinction. It's not just like you know some kind of marketing speak, but I actually do believe that it's more of a tool than just like a product. Mm -hmm. um, so web containers is just it's such a massive um, advancement in um in web development in what is actually possible and also our mission behind the web containers is we are really serious about making um making tech more accessible making web development more equitable because you know web containers it runs entirely in the in the browser because of that you don't you don't need a good internet connection you also don't need like super amazing laptop so because of that you see like there's a lot that comes to web containers when we are thinking about it because of that we decided to have a separate space which we can grow now our already our just stack this offering is um we have so many different pathways for people to be engaged with StackBit. So we have Codeflow, which is our uh, full-fledged uh, ID. We have the small ID for uh, like demos, right? And bug reproductions. We have Web Publisher, which is an um, this is like a tool for very easy uh, docs editing. And I use the word "easy" really carefully, but this is made for people who are in a rush or maybe not really technical, right? And so our our dog site was already kind of bloated. Because of that, we thought that by moving web containers to its own space, that would be just easier for people to um, find the information, to just quickly get what they need. This wasn't so much of a marketing uh, strategy. And if it was, please tell me <laughs> so then I can brag about it. Um, it's really because it's much easier to manage content that is, um, I'm, docu I'm a documentarian first and foremost, so it's much easier to manage content that is kind of contained, and it is much easier to direct your users to specific points, you know, on a website. Um, so in a way, it's all about just taking the perspective of a user who is overwhelmed who doesn't like to new, uh, learn new things. And because of that, if there is like a little corner uh, specifically designed for them, it's just just more friendly and just easier to manage. I don't know if that provides any clarity. No, but... I think that's a, that's a nice answer. Okay, great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, actually we, well, write documentation the you know well done documentation is extremely important for dev tools and we will do a whole separate episode on documentation maybe sylvia can revisit that one but uh documentation is definitely something that you know need it needs to be unpacked <laughs> to a greater extent because i think there's a lot to be said about that but let's come back to the releases a little bit and andre maybe you can tell us about your major releases because i feel like You've had a few. <laughs> I hope you forgot about me. Uh, because like I am the worst person to ask about this question. Like I released uh post SS8 about uh, two years ago, even more, like it's about three. And I uh 
was able to move from the United States to the Spain during this time, like changed a lot of my life, but still most of the plugins is still use post CSS uh, 7. And this is the main release which people download from the NPM. So yep, it was not so good project. <laughs> so good release. But um at least the few problems which we uh, avoided is that like don't came with release from nowhere. Like prepare your like, community from uh, months ahead and like give them information about how it will be and give them a way to test their environment in like your new shiny software, which will not work in their environment because it's completely different. And of course, provide immigration guide. At least this is um, most important one for the tools like post CSS when it's API and people need to change their code to be able to work with this tool. And uh, the interesting insight which we found like during this migration post CSS is some sort of the tool in the middle when you need uh, some sort of the runner webpack or like another uh, tool which compiles uh, your website and plugins and so first we need to rewrite whole set of the plugins and also we need to rewrite the webpacks to release a new version of webpack etc and we like for the second Problem, we uh, started the whole page with the current status of mm -hmm. each uh, runner and the, like what issue is was opened about this problem, what you should use, how you should migrate, and it's helped a lot for the mm -hmm. users, at least for some of them to migrate. I hope they finally post SS7 will have less people, less users that post SS8. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, I mean, I feel like people really. Um get accustomed to software, you know, to solutions, the way they're done in a certain way. And I remember, I mean, when Instagram updated, do you guys remember that? Like for me, it was major stress. Like I'm just like not big on those changes, even though now I don't even realize that it has changed. Right. But I, I know that people have resistance to new things and it's very important to ease them in into something new, especially when it's something that has to do with the core functionality of their product. Right. When it hugely like impacts their day to day life. Uh, let's talk about some other common pitfalls that maybe products do in terms of communities. Uh, Don, let's start with you. Um, like, what are some common pitfalls that you see in businesses, uh, maybe particularly in dev tools, and what do you think is important to keep in mind to avoid to avoid those kind of situations? Mm, common pitfalls. So I think I think we've actually touched on a lot of them already, right? Uh, like not engaging with your community or failing to follow through with your mm -hmm. community, right? So setting up a Discord, inviting people to come in and, and chat, and maybe some of them do, and, and, and then crickets, right? Because you and your team don't have the time to properly engage with the community uh, and keep the conversation going, keep, keep people feeling like, like there's something there, right? Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. It's really time consuming. I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of effort that goes into it. Um, and just how valuable a community manager can, can be for these sorts of things. Um, I think the other major pitfall that, that I see, and this is a completely different thing whatsoever, is, is confusing uh, community and, and, and audience, right? So um, an audience is a target for a, a one-to-many unidirectional communications platform, right? So advertising. Advertise to an audience. There's no chance for really to, to talk back. They just see the the poster, the the TV ad, right? But mm -hmm. probably not for the products we're talking about, right? But but in general, um, and so I think a lot of people mistake a community for um, an email list that they can send a blast out to, or or people who are just going to automatically like everything you post on Twitter. Um, and the result is unidirectional communication that centers the product, the company, right? Um, as opposed to um, treating your community as a community uh, mm -hmm. and treating yourself as a part of that community and sending out communications that are not about you, that, that are about that are about the community, that are about the people in it, that, that are you know, lifting them up and talking about the things that they're doing uh, or, or attempting to engage with them on their terms, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that requires shifting a lot of thinking away from more traditional marketing as a way of gathering leads to shift over the sales team um, and thinking more about how do I behave as a welcome participant? Um, how do I not make this about 
me and my product and my business? How do I make it about the people that I want to I want to reach out to and embrace? And I think that's for many people a very um, non obvious mental shift to to make. Um, but but you have to make it. You have to make it like early on uh, to to succeed. Yeah. So that th those I think are the, the off the top of my head the, the two the two things I see the most that are that are um, easy fixes I think but require mental shift. Yeah. For sure. Tech marketing is also something that we will be unpacking as a separate episode of uh, this roundtable because I feel like many companies abuse emails. Like emails are so like it's so outdated. Like, come on, like I'm I'm muted like all my emails, you know, I just I'm not about that life. But well, um, let me just let me just say, like, if, if the name of the product is not in the sender or the subject line, no, nobody knows who this email is from and why it's relevant or important. <laughs> I get I get so many emails from startups like this from 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 John. We're changing our <laughs> terms of service. You should be excited. Like, is a spam? Is sorry, yeah. but I had to mention that because I get so many. Emails. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel like we're in the new ethics, the new era in tech marketing, and it's definitely something that's changing a lot. And it's becoming more human. So I think, uh, yeah, that's definitely worth like a separate discussion. Uh, ben, how about you? Do you do you have anything to add? Any common pitfalls that you see or maybe have experienced yourself uh, in products? At least for us, I think our first common pitfall was we saw, like if you go to our website, there's like a page, it's like download Teleport. Do you want community edition or enterprise? And I think the pitfall we made was like, oh, anyone who goes left, put them into like the Slack room, never reply to their GitHub tickets. Like we don't care about them. <laughs> As a business, we only want the people on the right. And obviously this is a very short-sighted view of what your community is. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I touched on this earlier, like some of our best community advocates who have the most interesting use cases, they'll create... Um, like uh, there's like SE Linux for like locking down um, Linux machines. And we're like, oh, this guy works this Fortune 500 fintech company. He's using SE Linux. Are they using it at their organization? He's like, no, I just like a really strong, secure home lab. And I like tinkering <laughs> with it, which I don't know why anyone would want to set up like SE Linux in the home lab, but <laughs> um, people are keen advocates. And so I think we the way in which we sort of view this discussion and as we think about moving forwards is because our issues are all open and public, both for enterprise and community users, you can, like, I think another risk is like to try to decloak people. We generally don't like decloak people. We sort of respect their privacy as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about like, you know, in a similar thing, Andre, like people upvoting and seeing like what has the most sort of likes, um, into sort of our review cycle and just taking like all of our community feedback, whether it's in like our Slack or our GitHub issues and thinking about like, okay, what's the problem that all these people are sort of encountering? The answer to the problem isn't necessarily the reply to the ticket, mm -hmm. but there might be another problem that we solve. Mm -hmm. And the way in which we became more transparent about our decision-making about solving their problems is our uh, design documents are also in GitHub. And so we can say like, hey, we're not going to fix this problem, but look at this like RFD. You mm -hmm. can see how about we're going to solve this problem in a different way that will sort of solve your problems. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of how we sort of close that loop of sort of open source kind of feedback and engineering design development The sort of we are still building like a robust product and also solving the businesses um, mm -hmm. business problems. So I think that's another risk of like open core products. Like I think our backlog is like 2,000 issues. Mm -hmm. If we were to like solve every 2,000 issues, we would end up with like a, a, you know, like the Homer Simpson card that he designs himself. And so <laughs> you don't want to build that either. That's hilarious. Um, all right. Uh, so we are, uh, let, Sylvia, let's let's talk about bad things and then we'll end on a good note. We'll <laughs> talk about something nice. So uh, tell us about Common Pitfalls or what you believe common pitfalls are. We already touched a little bit on the Discord, you know, and crickets. <laughs> Maybe you can just tell us some other some other uh, mm, common pitfalls that you see that happen, or maybe you have experienced yourself. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, so I really believe in that how we 
talk to our community um, that we are in that we are shaping the community, right? So what I see, what is my pet peeve in communication and in discourse in discourse in general is um, this whole like winning losing discourse or like superiority discourse. Like basically, I really I really see that the communities that are that the leaders who are you know subscribing to this kind of framing of their product or of their community actually have communities that are you know like not necessarily as friendly as they could be mm -hmm. and it even goes down to just like i don't want anyone on our discord to be comparing uh you know i mean meritorical comparison between like uh stack bits and uh, competition sure but just like saying oh stack bits the stack bits rocks and that solution you know some kind of horrible speech i don't want that like we don't need that so if you're trying to build your whole like community around the idea that this is the winning team um i can take a bet that sooner or later the people who were subscribing to that you know will also be really disappointed and very loud because mm -hmm. then they are not subscribing to the idea of your community. They are subscribing to the idea of winning. And so the moment you are you know, struggling, um, you will not have their support most, most I mean, necessarily, right? The other thing is um, also like kind of like connected to like if we view community through rankings, then we are more prone to rewarding people who are uh, singing pra praises and of course it's nice I mean like we all yeah. like like to hear nice things but I actually really appreciate also folks who you know are just like always have something to say that is like not perfect <laughs> who are just like I don't know we have a major release and everyone is happy and there's this person yeah but have you seen that button <laughs> I mean like it's not rounded is it <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> I love that. Bring it to me. Like, give, tell me all feedback, positive, negative. I I will cherish it together. I mean, like the same way. It's because where I'm uh, I'm coming from the idea of that we are really creating something meaningful. And so, if uh, this is how you relate to people, and I, I mean, if you if you're not doing that out of malice, but this is your contribution, and I really value that. And if you all think like, oh, I'm gonna challenge you. Please do. <laughs> I'm very patient. But yeah, I I think that it is really important to not equate uh, criticism, you know, as a negative trait of a person. Like just uh -huh. reframe it in your head and just view it as their contribution, their, you know, well-meaning gift for you. And then you can decide what you will do with this gift. And then the last uh -huh. thing, which is, um, you know... <laughs> Many co many communities, if not majority, are built by men, <sighs> and um, in the in the design, many problems are not even like accounted for. I can't tell you the number of times where um, a very you know very mellow blog post on dev triggered DMs, really vile DMs, or like comments on every single tweet that I made uh, from like dudes. And so now the dev community has an excellent way of dealing with this kind of stuff, but that's not the case for many discourse. And so I would say, hey, make sure that your team is diverse, you know, and not only women, but just generally diverse, because there, even if you think you're open-minded, there are things you cannot think about. And so, yeah. Can I add something to that? Go for, on. For people who are watching and listening, whatever you do, for the love of God, do not use Slack for your discussion <laughs> platform. Please, it may seem like a very good idea. It may seem like an excellent idea, but you are wrong. There are no moderation tools. There are so many design that will never be removed because they're suited to a very, very different use case than mm -hmm. running a public community. It's completely unsuitable if you want to have a diverse community. Don't do it, please. What What is the best tool for the community? I, I don't know if there's a best tool. Discord at least does have moderation tools mm -hmm. and does have ways of cutting off a number of, of common harassment factors. So I generally I generally recommend Discord over 
over Slack for that reason. Okay. Thank you. I never thought about that. Uh, this is so. Uh, this is such a good insight. I find this course really overwhelming, but now actually you changed my mind. You should, you know, like um, tag the Discord uh, community folks and just ask for some. I don't know, you know, sponsorship. <laughs> just a collection sticker would do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, I also wanted to thank Sylvia because I think I got my biggest takeaway just from your speech right now. Uh, like it's, I love the idea that when people are criticizing you, it's their way of connecting. I never, I never thought about it that way, you know. So, like, um, I'm very sensitive to criticism, but I think I'm gonna change, you know, my mind because this is, you know. You, thank you like oh, this is something I, I've learned today so and I'm I an, really happy <laughs> I have an analogy to go with that um okay. so I the, the way I, so I'm also very sensitive and so the way I reframed this uh you know handling um not necessarily criticism but even like just not not enthusiasm is by just thinking about it as you know this is let's say a, a gift um let's say your aunt made a jumper for you and it's really ugly and really uncomfortable and so but this is a gift and so you can accept it and you know recognize her effort but then you can decide what you're gonna do with that sweater or jumper right so you can shove it into the cupboard or like wherever you keep your jumpers you can wear it you can also just you know it can disappear <laughs> you can recognize the effort and the intention and then decide what you're gonna do with that i like that thank you um so we are about to end this uh, lovely conversation let's end with a good note how about each of you shares a really nice lovely story that has to do with the community let's start with sylvia and then we'll just i'll i'll direct it from there Maybe we start with someone else because I've been speaking and just like I'm already tired of my voice for a second. So let's uh, cleanse the palate and then we can get back to it. <laughs> okay. Don, do you want to start? Okay. I, I guess this is a good story. Maybe it's a good story. It's a fun story anyway of, of a community member doing something great. So so uh, at, at Slack, when, when I was working there, the API was used both for the, the product and for uh, public usage. And there, there are some private APIs as well, but all the public APIs have been developed for internal use initially, right? Um, and it turns out that some of our community were experiencing regular 500 errors on the API that we weren't detecting on our end because the volume of those errors was so low, it was basically just noise, right? Because we're looking at all usage of the, the API, which is mostly the, the clients, right? Like the, the Slack clients. Um, and so we, we had no, no notion that, that something was wrong. Um, and so one of our community members built a tool um, that would alert him, wake him up, uh, if need be in the middle of the night, uh, when when they were seeing a batch of 500 errors. Um, and this, this tool was actually ultimately really useful for the community and really useful for tracking down the problem because then I would get a, an email or a DM, right? Very urgent, like it's happening right now, the 500 errors, tell your ops team to do something about this or, or go figure out what's happening. And, and, and the data was actually really, really useful for ultimately finding a fairly serious but extremely rare bug that was only being triggered by certain ways of using our API that were way more common for, for apps than, than, than happened in the client. So it had a really, really nice ending to it. Wow. That's, a, that's like a nice jumper gift, you know? <laughs> um, ben, how about you? Um, yeah, I have a great one. Um... I know, I know this is terrible. I did pitch Teleport because I haven't really described what Teleport is, and I think it will be a good story on why this is a good story. So Teleport is a tool that people use for accessing their infrastructure. It can be their servers, their Kubernetes clusters, their databases. And often what you see is, um, you know, uh, organizations grow, there's a whole bunch of engineers, they're joining like crazy, and how do you provide access with like sh uh, short-lived credentials that's like very secure? But we also have our open source edition. And I think um, I was chatting to one of our community users. He's been a long-term user of Teleport. And he uses it in his home lab to share um, 
a CSGO server with his brother who's in another country and they like get on it and they debug it. And he has like a few other things that he sort of debugs. And we were talking through some of the product capabilities and um, we have session recording. So when you go into a session, it records everything that you did. And often we pitch this as sort of, it's for security compliance, it's for like the CISO. But he's like, oh, I love this product. It's like my journal. And he's like, I now know what I did like last Wednesday on my server. I can go back and I'd be like, okay, I can like remember this. And I think, I think Silver so kind of mentioned this, the ways in which people take sort of open source free products opens up a whole bunch of possibilities that you wouldn't necessarily know. And I think also having that feedback loop and be like, okay, maybe there's more that we can break out. Like maybe there's a noting and journaling product that we could launch as a commercial product, or maybe just the way in which we talk about this uh, product feature that provides like more value to our people. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, it's like a, an episode of Black Mirror, you know, when people are just using <laughs> like different cybersecurity tools to just journal. Uh, Andre, how about you? Tell us an, a lovely story about you and your community. Uh, when processes was very small, it was about, you know, I don't know, 60 plugins or something. So like very, uh, for very small amount of the people, uh, I decided to st uh, to write a personal um, card to every plugin developers. I collect the emails, got about the, the, the 10 uh, mail addresses, wrote it. And it like, you know, um, when your project is very small, you don't really believe that all these people who do something on top of your tool is real people. You think that maybe it's like, you know, some sort of joke of your colleagues, etc. But when you're writing uh, these emails to a very different part of the world, you understand that this is real people because sometimes mm -hmm. you know in any some countries there is no uh, mail addresses like there is no numbers on the uh, houses so you like just explain how to find the house on the like on the on the card and but um on the next year uh, uh, it was a very uh, fast growth and we have about uh, 400 plugins wow. and so it it, wow. it leads about 100 uh, cards and it took me about a week to write every card but no, it still was amazing experience. I was definitely happy as well because, you know, uh, and other people as well will see that their plugin is not, you know, some project, some code on the GitHub. They will feel that this is something real, that we see people who really love them for their project. And it was very fun. To be honest, I stopped to do it because it was too hard to write under the events. <laughs> Um, it would be nice to create like a Twitter thread with all your postcards that you had have sent, you know, from different people. Um, Sylvia, so, yeah, do you want? Do you want to add something? Yeah, definitely. This is all these stories are so lovely. Um, well, because uh, Andre mentioned, uh, shared the story of like a macro perspective. Maybe I will uh, share a story of micro perspective. So, um, so. Let's so quite so a few months ago there was a person who submitted a typo uh, edit to our docs, and um, as I say that was also before uh, the, that was also right after we adopted Web Publisher for uh, the docs editing. That's important because as I said the uh, Web Publisher it is um, a tool that was designed for people who are maybe not that technical or like you know. Yeah, who maybe don't are not really comfortable with the whole like uh, cloning and uh, running dependencies flow. Mm -hmm. And so I see a PR from, you know, just a typo edit from a person. So I respond to that. Of course, I merge and I thank, uh, thank the person. And then, you know, a week later, I see three PRs um, from the same person with like, you know, more advanced uh, kind of um, either you know restructuring or maybe um i don't know some kind of bug fixes two of them were from the web publisher and one was from our like full-blown ide and so of course i also merged that in one of them uh, we actually had a conversation afterwards uh, i get a message on discord from this person um and they thank me because this was actually their first contribution ever to open source and so now they feel more brave and so on and so forth and now I actually just saw that they published literally today, uh, they published a blog post about, you know, their experience with open source beyond StackBits. So now they are actually contributing to different frameworks and now they are very active in one of the one of them. So this is like really just really 
a happy story on how, you know, if you are just helping people, I don't know, if you're just nice, people grow and they share also this growth with you. They take you on a little journey. So. Yeah, that's very, that's very uh, heartwarming. Um, I think this is a great note to end it. Um, I want to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart because this is the first experience for me of sorts and this went beyond my expectations you guys are amazing uh, thank you so much for being so uh, great insightful there is so much to learn from this conversation I have personally learned from this conversation so um, thank you very much and uh, this video will be available online so people will be able to go back and watch it if they want to feel inspired or you know maybe they'll commit a PR after that we'll see um, so thank you guys uh, have a great day and um, we'll see you in the next episode which will happen on April 13th it's going to be dedicated to tech marketing and it's going to feature Superbase, Fly.io, Netlify, and Evo Martians. So we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you. And for you all.